Hello and welcome back to Leader Up, a podcast of Army Management Staff College. Leader Up is a professional conversation where we discuss a broad range of leadership and leader development topics with an emphasis on the Army civilian professional. I'm your host, David Howie. Let me ask you, Leader Up audience, are you familiar with a new Army entity called the Army Civilian Career Management Activity? Do you know who they are, what they are, why they are, and what they will do for you as a member of the Army Civilian Corps? By the end of this episode of Leader Up, we hope to make you a little more aware of ACMA and the Army's renewed focus on career management in the Army Civilian Corps. On today's episode, we have two guests from ACMA. The first is the director of ACMA's Operations and Plans Directorate, Mr. Mike DeYoung. Mike DeYoung, thank you so much for being with us today on Leader Up. David, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for having me on your uh, podcast. Thank you, sir. We, We certainly do appreciate it. And our second guest, is the Chief of ACMA's Operations Division, Carla Langland. Carla Langland, thank you also for being with us today on Leader Up. Thank you so much, David. We really appreciate this opportunity to talk about ACMA. All right. Well, I, I know our Leader Up audience out there um, is is anxious to hear about what this organization is and, and how they can help the Army civilians. So let me start with you, Mike, uh, if I might. Just I, I've I've heard this acronym ACMA A C C M A, uh, and just tell our leader up audience what is ACMA what what does it what does it do what's it supposed to do and how can it help the Army Civilian Corps? You know, great intro question, David. And uh, as you mentioned earlier, ACMA is the Army Civilian Career Management Activity. Uh, it stood up on 1 October 2020 and is a subordinate organization to CHARA, the Civilian Human Resources Agency. I'd like to say about ACMA is that we're centered around 11 career fields, vice the old career management construct of 32 career programs. The 32 career programs did not go away. Instead, the ACMA organization consolidated these 32 career programs into 11 career field, which grouped related career programs together. Uh, It's to improve the Army's ability to manage and develop our civilian talent within a broader functional lanes. We'll talk more about this later. Okay. And, uh, and let me ask you, Carla, um, what what was the need in the Army Civilian Corps that caused ACMA to be created? That's a great question, David. So I've, I've got a short answer and a long answer. Uh, the short answer to provide a more cohesive, coordinated framework to allow for the growth of the Army Civilian Corps um, in terms of training and development. But what exactly does that mean? That sounds a bit like a PR pitch. Um, So the longer answer is, as Mike mentioned, we had 32 career programs. They were in various headquarters, DA staff elements, various commands. Uh, There was limited integration, uh, efficiencies, coordination. In fact, there was very much a silo mentality among these 32 career programs. So the first point is from an organizational perspective, it made sense to consolidate the operation of the 32 career programs into one organization. But as Mike pointed out, though, the foundation of ACMA are the 11 career fields. So when ACMA was created, it wasn't just to consolidate the 32 career programs, but really to establish these 11 career fields. And why was this done? Ultimately, to support and provide our Army Civilian Corps with greater opportunities for growth and development. And we wanna make sure that individuals who want to aspire to senior leader positions have the uh, potential for broad experiences. Um, We also want to promote multifunctional leaders and the intent behind then the career field was to allow civilians to broaden their experiences, seek rewarding opportunities 
but the last thing I want to say right there too is that, you know, we know we have army civilians out there who aren't interested in the high senior level positions in the army and that's okay. We know not everybody aspires to those positions, but everybody seeks personal and professional growth and ACMA wants to support that. And I want to ask about something I think is related to that response that you just gave me, Carla. And Mike, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. This phrase that I've heard for several years, uh, talent management. W- what is talent management and what, what will be ACMA's role in talent management in the Army Civilian Corps? So, David, again, great question because it brings to the fore part of ACMA's mission. So there's actually an OPM definition of talent management. To get technical there, a system that promotes higher performing workforce. It identifies and closes skills gaps. It implements and maintains programs to attract, acquire, develop, promote, and retain quality and diverse talent. But, you know, what does that really mean? You know, you can read things on the website. You can read in a manual. What does it mean? It's all about people. You know, do we have the policies, the procedures, the regulations, the processes in place? So that what we're looking to do is hire the right person, develop that person for mission accomplishment, as well as their professional development, and to retain our workforce. Although I will caveat that with it's always good to have turnover to bring in fresh ideas and fresh perspectives and new uh, technologies there. You know, General McConville, our current chief of staff, declared when he assumed the position that his number one priority is people. And those people include soldiers, family members, veterans, and Army civilians. You know, the Army is about people. Talent management is about enabling opportunities for people to excel. And it's not done in a vacuum. We're all involved in this effort. ACMA, the commands, supervisors, uniformed military members, and our Army civilians. So again, talent management is about people. Okay, and I want to go back to, uh, let's let's go down to maybe some, some real nuts and bolts things in the Army Civilian Corps. Something that everybody is kind of familiar with, and it's the individual development plan. And I just want to ask you, Carla, what, what is the importance uh, regarding everything that we've talked about so far, talent management, the people and all of that, what is the importance of the IDP in, uh, in talent management or in managing uh, army civilians, managing their own careers? I really want to be able to answer that question, David, because I'm a, I'm pretty passionate about the, an individual development plan. First, I always like to point out to people, it's a roadmap. And to some extent, it's a contract between you as an employee and your supervisor. Most important when creating an IDP, it forces you to think. It forces you to plan. It forces you to ponder. What are my goals and aspirations? How can I achieve those goals? What are the resources? What are the training requirements needed to reach those goals? I want to put a plug in here for Army Career Tracker. They have an excellent IDP framework for you as Army civilians to be able to create your IDP. I know, of course, that some Army civilians are required to use CATMIS if they're in the acquisition corps. Some commands use TED the total employee development, but whatever system you use, the most important thing is uh, if done deliberately, it's a very valuable thinking process. And I want, I want to uh, challenge all the supervisors out there. Take this annual requirement seriously. Your greatest duty as a supervisor is developing your employees and the IDP is a foundation for that requirement. And to get a little philosophical here, um, sometimes you don't reach your goals, and that's okay. 
life is all about the journey, not the destination. So you may put in a bunch of great training courses in your IDP and you take them and you're doing great and you still don't get that promotion. That's okay. You've learned and developed along the way. And I'd like to go back to uh, something that, that you mentioned earlier, Carla, you were talking about the, the, the transition from the career programs to now the, the career fields. And so, uh, Mike, if you can address this, does, does this mean that those uh, career programs, CP32 and all that and all the other ones, are those gone uh, now that we've gone from the 32 uh, career programs, we've now gone down to 11. Uh, are, are those CPs, are those gone away? Have those gone away? So, David, I'm going to give you a straight answer. Actually, it's not so straight. Yes and no. <laughs> there are no more career programs, but, but that's because we've changed the name to functional communities. So, no, they're not around because we've changed the name. And yes, because the concept remains. And you may ask, why did we change the name to functional community? And we did so for a couple of reasons. One is that it corresponds with the naming convention of DOD, which aligns its workforce into functional communities. And secondly, we are currently looking at various other tiered structures that will more easily allow us, that's ACMA, to internally view the Army civilian workforce. And then externally, it will allow Army civilians to see the myriad opportunities that may be available out there. So in the past, these opportunities, and Carla said this earlier in a response, were stovepiped primarily within a career program. You mentioned CP32. You didn't necessarily see with a very closely related CP31 have as opportunities, although some of the many functional competencies and core competencies were much the same. So with the stovepipe, you just didn't have that view. So what we want to do is provide the Army civilian workforce the ability to navigate their careers between different career programs or functional communities. By having an initial initial name change and further investigating into other organizational constructs, you know, we're looking at providing greater assistance to Army civilian workforce in developing, sustaining their individual talent. We've got to break the old paradigm. We've got to break the old mold and functional communities is one of the ways we do so. And so what I, what I think I'm hearing is that the, the career programs are, are now called functional communities and and those have been aligned under those 11 career fields and i think carla you were talking about the the importance of developing multifunctional leaders and so is this is this this a way that the army can uh encourage people or provide a path for people to learn m- more than just uh that uh that narrow skill that narrow function? Is that kind of the the uh, intent behind this move? Yes, David, absolutely. It, it, is, it is definitely, that is exactly the reason why. The intent here is that we know that there are myriad opportunities out there for our civilian employees. And, it, and it's not as if in the past people didn't pursue opportunities within their um, very narrow a career program, we want to be able to formally provide greater opportunities for our uh, Army Civilian Corps. And, and so if, if I'm in, and, and everybody that's an, in part of the Army Civilian Corps, if, if I'm under one of the 11 career fields, that uh, allows me to um, have exposure to other functions or other skill sets other than my own. That's, I, is that's kind of the way I see that. That is, that is absolutely correct. Certainly now we are looking to see what we can do to expand within the career fields themselves. Ultimately, we want to ensure that we can 
um, really, and this is what uh, Mike was referring to, maybe looking at different structures here. How do we see interconnectivities between what a data scientist might need to know versus what a uh, human resources specialist might need to know? There are commonalities, and that's what we're looking for. And of these 11 career fields, Carla, which which one is the biggest? Which one has, has the most people in it? Great question. It's the logistics career field at nearly 60,000 employees aligned to it with the uh, under uh, with the six functional communities underneath it. And that's not particularly surprising. Uh, Army c- civilians are employed um, and support primarily the generating force. Um, and there are 10 other career fields, but that is the largest there at 60,000. Okay, I, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Mike, and I, I'll I'll start with you. Um, uh, these these terms and phrases that I've heard, and I think they're new. You can tell me, uh, career field directors, functional chiefs, and uh, a career field functional advisor. Um, wh- who are those people, uh, and what are their roles? Certainly, uh, David. As Carla mentioned, when we first of all, when we brought together the 32 career programs into 11 career fields from organizations that were throughout the Army at various command levels and various commands, uh, you know, we didn't want to have the same former terms because it didn't always apply to the new construct. So. Before I get into the specific roles and responsibilities of the individuals you mentioned, the career field directors, functional chief, and career field functional advisor, I want to point out something that is important for our Army civilian workforce to understand, and that is there are senior leaders, SESs, who play a role in Army civilian talent management. They care about the growth professionalism, development of our Army civilian workforce. And so, in fact, each of our career field functional chiefs is an SES. And this individual is the senior career civilian official within each career field and is responsible for the strategic talent management of Army civilians within their broad functional area. And the FC is also a member of the governing body, and there are governing bodies for civilians, that directs talent management initiatives and resource allocations to the career fields. So within that career field, the functional communities, each functional community also has an SES who is their champion. This individual serves as a technical advisor to the functional chief for that functional area. Uh, And I want to point out, and this is it, clearly these roles, these SES roles, are additional duties uh, for whom I acknowledge are very busy Army senior leaders. However, when you have seen the commitment of these functional chiefs at various career field planning boards and other activities we have, uh, you know, the Army civilians should know and take away that our SESs are committing to having the best, well-developed, professionally developed civilian talent out there. And so, as a follow-on, there are 11 career fields within ACMA. And so, part of the ACMA structure, full-time, they're part of our TDA, we have career field directors. Each career field has a career field director. Each career field director has a staff for each of their functional communities. So again, in the past where you had career program manager, now you've got a functional community manager, so to speak, who helps manage that one. And within that career field also, there's an integrator or an integrator team, depending upon the size, uh, who pulls and integrates commonalities of requirements and functions across 
the career field to make sure that that career field is working in the same direction and they're integrating their initiatives. And so as an Army civilian, generally, you would work with one of the functional community managers that you are aligned to. And is that the person that is is uh, I would be the closest to at an at an installation? Depending upon the structure within it, there are at the various installation levels uh, command functional community managers, command functional program managers, and Carla, you'd like to expand on that a bit. The intent here is that we push down as much as possible the the first full-time employee working this would be that functional community manager uh, but at commands uh, we have a representative there who works with um, who is a functional community representative that uh, person can definitely help out individuals. Again, that is an additional duty for each of those individuals. Uh, but that intent, though, is to push that down as uh, as far as possible. Okay. Um, I think I understand. And so let, let's go back to uh, ACMA, this this activity that, that falls under CHARA, uh, that is supposed to manage uh, these these career fields. What is, what is their role regarding uh, these career fields? And that's a really great question, David, because it's something, frankly, that we struggle with this distinction, even within ACMA. I just want to point out that ACMA is composed of the career fields, and the career fields are at ACMA. It's, it's one organization. Now, within ACMA, in addition to consolidating the old 32 career programs, creating the 11 career fields. Uh, when ACMA was stood up uh, almost a year ago, in addition to those two structures, what was also created was an operations and plans directorate and a career management support division. Now, these two entities were created for the same reasons any headquarters element or support element is created and to provide guidance, coordination, resources. Um, Sometimes we find, and and this may be more of an internal thing than an external, but that um, people refer to the operations and plans directorate as ACMA to distinguish between um, the operations plans directorate and uh, correction in the career fields, but we're all ACMA, we're all one organization, we all have one mission, and that is to support our Army civilian um, careers. Okay, let me let me uh, go back to you, Mike. I, I, let's let's say that I'm uh, a, a supervisory GS twelve budget uh, person at, at an Army depot somewhere, Red River Depot or Corpus Christi. And I've got four or five budget analysts that work for me. What is ACMA going to do for me and my employees to help us train, grow in our careers, get better at our jobs? So, David, at a very tactical level, ACMA, and specifically your career field, which in the case of your question is the human capital and resource management career field. Uh, can, ACMA can fund training courses, provide career maps that determine mm, appropriate developmental opportunities. Uh, they can assist in determining and providing certification and credentialing programs. Stepping back a bit at a more strategic level, ACMA as part of our talent management and looking to the future to fill the gaps, to look at what the needs are of the workforce. Uh, one of the programs we have is called the Army Fellows Program. So if you're a supervisory budget al- analyst and you're looking at your succession planning and realize you need to recruit an entry-level employee that you can help develop, the Army Fellows Program 
Uh, and again, this was previously referred to as the Army Career Development Program, and before that, the DA Intern Program. It is now an Army Fellows Program, but that may be a tool you can use. You know, funded two-year positions that typically start at a GS-7 to a GS-9. At the end of the two years, they end up as a GS-11, funded by ACMA, and so supervised by the person down there. And you're helping develop that talent. And we can talk about enterprise-wide talent development later, but that's a tool that can be used. Uh, and if you don't mind, I would like to go back very briefly to the question before. Uh, I was a career program manager in the past. And while I had communication with my 31 other fellow career program managers, there wasn't the type of communication that goes on now within ACMA, within our career fields and within the functional communities, uh, as well as the operations and plans directorate. It, it is a matrix organization that is support. There aren't a lot of, there isn't a lot of bureaucracy. We try to get things done. So, uh, I just wanted to throw that in to add. So, so at what I'm, what I think I'm hearing you say is that ACMA provides a, a, a forum or a way for these different career fields to synchronize and, and work together uh, and share information. And, and what about um, training? So let's, let's say I've got, uh, and Carl, I'll, I'll ask you this. Um, if I've got, I'm that GS 12, uh, supervisory budget person, and I've got an employee that I believe needs some kind of functional training about their job. It does, does ACMA have a role in that? Absolutely. Now, the first thing I want to point out though, and I have to be honest here, ACMA is not funded to be the sole source of training for the Army Civilian Corps. Um, commands have a role in this as well. So just because an employee requests training does not mean that she may be funded for the training. And again, I just want to point that out. But um, yes, we have a very big role in that. Now, the general process is the career fields will announce training opportunities to their population. And then employees will either apply for the training or sign up for the training. And that's a that's a significant distinction because some of our training is um, competitive professional development and it requires an application process and uh, a competitive process to be selected. The key I want to point out here is that employees must have an Army Ignited account to be able to take advantage of any ACMA funded training. Army Ignited is an online platform uh, the Army uses it for tuition assistance for soldiers, uses it for uh, scholarship management for ROTC cadets, and uses it for the ACMA-funded training for Army civilians. Not career-funded, or correction, not command-funded, but ACMA-funded. So employees need to go to, if they haven't already, um, www.armyignited.com, and that link will be in the show notes. Um, and sign up for an account. When an employee submits an SF-182, um, they has to have a um, they must have an account within Army Ignited to be able um, to get that training funded um, by ACMA. But absolutely, one of our m main uh, missions out there is the training and development. Uh, we do that through promoting various training opportunities, uh, developing career maps, but funding training as well. And then let's talk about, uh, and Mike, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. What role will ACMA have in, let's say, recruiting um, new employees and uh, the other part of recruiting that sometimes doesn't get as much attention, that's onboarding. What What's ACMA's role in those things? Uh, David, uh, I'm glad you asked that because uh, this is a really exciting area that ACMA is getting involved in. Uh, I will say, when you look across the Army, some commands have a very robust recruiting program 
for Army civilians. And while others rely almost exclusively on throwing something up on USA jobs and announcing the opportunities. Uh, and so what we're doing in ACMA is we have developed a recruiting and outreach plan to conduct recruiting events at university, professional associations, and we're focusing on entry-level positions. So we want to expand upon that later, but we've developed this plan to focus on entry-level positions. So what we're doing is coordinating with commands across the career fields to integrate these outreach efforts. Again, taking some of the best practices that we've seen out in the commands, plus looking towards best practices across an industry. Uh, I'm excited because just in the past week or so, we held our first college fair recruiting event. Uh, we used a talent management platform that most colleges and universities use to attract and reach out to their student populations. Uh, and we had a good response. Uh, and so we're also finalizing a contract for another talent management platform that we'll use hand in hand so that not only will we eventually be recruiting college students, but we can also help recruit for most Army civilian positions. Again, collaboration with the commands, but we want to take the burden away from them. Um, so also say, not more importantly, but significantly important is an enterprise level onboarding plan that commands can use when they hire new employees. If your first experience coming into the army or a new organization is kind of blah and you don't get excited or get, you know, know much about it other than, Hey, they're paying me some money and such. Um, you've kind of lost the employee right at the beginning. So onboarding is important because first impressions are so important. Uh, you know, a good onboarding program quickly acclimates the employees to their roles and their role in the accomplishment of the Army and the command's mission. So a good onboarding program also engages the employee. It creates employees who are committed to the Army's success. And finally, a good onboarding program helps retain new hires by making them feel like a member of the team. Well, I want to thank both of you for your time. Uh, and on behalf of our Leader Up audience, thank you for explaining uh, who ACMA is. Um, and we're, we're coming to the end of our time. But I want to ask, uh, and Carl, I'll ask you, where can uh, someone who is out in the Leader Up audience find out more information about ACMA or the the this career field organization that the Army has initiated? Great question there, David. So right now, the best place to find out more information about um, ACMA and uh, the functional communities and career fields is Army Career Tracker. Each of the functional communities has a web page on ACT. We are working with the program managers at ACT to have a, a career field pages as well. But right now, they're still functional community. And I, I have to be, I'm sure by the time this is um, published out there, uh, it'll be, I'll be correct in saying that they're actually still called even career program pages. Uh, but that is the best place to go in addition to the specific functional community pages there on ACT. It's also where we post our Army Civilian Talent Development Program Catalog. So that's a great place to go. I also want to put a plug in, though, for our Facebook page. Uh, we encourage all Army Civilian employees to follow us there on Facebook. And uh, we can have Producer Chad include uh, the a link to your Facebook page uh, on the show notes for this podcast. Um, I really do again, want to thank both of you and I'll just give you one more opportunity. Uh, uh, Mike, I'll start with you. Is, is there anything else about ACMA that, that I haven't asked that, that folks out there need to know? Uh, David, you've been pretty thorough uh, in your questions. So <laughs> we appreciate that. Uh, but again, I just want to emphasize that uh, it's an exciting time in Army civilian talent management and in talent management for the Army in general. And so we have processes 
And these processes are evolving, and we may not have them all in place. Remember, we just stood up on the 1st of October 2020, and we're coming to our one-year anniversary. We brought together people from all over the Army. So our processes are evolving, but the bottom line is we're here to support people. We're able to want to make that Army civilian better, and by doing such, we make our Army better. So, Okay, thank you, uh and Carla, do you have any final thoughts from you about uh, ACMA? I, I do, uh, David, and it's not necessarily directly related to ACMA, but I really think it's something that the audience will appreciate. I just want all of our Army civilian employees to know that the senior leadership in the Army, and that's both military and civilian, truly care about the health and welfare of our Army Civilian Corps. And I I don't believe I fully appreciated that until I saw that with the establishment of ACMA. But that was created because senior leaders saw a void, saw a need for this. And, and it's all about the development of our Army Civilian Corps in response to the Army mission. So I just want all of our... Uh, fellow Army civilian employees out there to know that the senior leadership really cares about you. Okay, well, thank you. And again, thank both of you. Uh, Mr. And it's Mr. Mike DeYoung from ACMA and Ms. Carla Langland. Thank you both for, for being with us today on Leader Up. And um, Leader Up audience, there you go. That's, that's everything you need to know about ACMA. So, uh, Find out who they are and and what they can do for you and, and your career. And this is your host, David Howie. Join us again next time for another episode of Leader Up. As always, if you have any questions or feedback or would like to learn more about our podcast, please check the description for our email and for our website. Thanks for listening.